honor of uh, uh, we have Dr. Nitin Verma. So can I ask all my course instructors to be on the dais? Uh, Dr. Professor Atul Kumar, Dr. Vishali, I think they are Manish. Phone for the Dr. Neeraj, come. Dr. Ritu. Dr. Manpreet, come on the dais. So since this course is uh, for the short duration, it's only 85 minutes, which includes uh, um, a lecture keynote address by Dr. Nitin Verma. Uh, so we will start off with his address. Uh, Dr. Nitin, as you know, uh, I've known him for many years, and I have a little association with him in the sense that I also spent some time in CMC Valor. Uh, so he has uh, graduated from CMC Valor, then he was trained uh, in various parts of India, uh, Germany, and Australia, and he has received numerous awards, including the 2013 TAS Australian of the Year Award, which is very, very creditable. He is on board of many committees in Australia and is the chief convener of the next RANSCO. That's this year, Nitin? Oh, it happened. Happened in September. Oh, okay. So he was the chief convener of uh, uh, the last RANSCO, which happened uh, in Hobart. And Hobart is supposed to be a, a, a beautiful city, and maybe all of us should sometime visit and uh, write to Nathan about uh, about Hobart. And so we welcome him, and he's a regular visitor to uh, this country. Uh, I welcome you, Dr. Nathan, and he'll be talking to us on managing neovascular glaucoma. Uh, Dr. Manish, can you join us on the stage? Professor Atul and Dr. Vishali. So he'll be talking on evidence-based management of diabetic retinopathy and macular edema. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think what I'm presenting is really a summary on the evidence base for our current management of uh, diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema. We live in exciting times now because for 30 years nothing happened. We would, we would laser somebody, we would make them uh, try and retain their vision, but now we've got OCTs, we've got uh, anti-VEGF agents and new protocols to try and actually improve vision rather than uh, just think about uh, preventing uh, severe loss of vision. But there are uh, many issues that need to be discussed and also barriers to be broken to get the best out of what we have uh, today. Diabetes is on the rise, and because of that, diabetic complications are on the rise, and that for us includes diabetic retinopathy, it develops in about a third of the patients, and then 11% develop uh, vision-threatening uh, diabetic changes in the eye. So we've really got to be prepared for a tsunami of, uh, of preventable blindness. But to understand diabetic retinopathy and manage diabetic retinopathy, we've got to understand the biology of diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy is a complication of a systemic disease, and therefore eye treatment is not sufficient. It's also a vascular disease, so surgery is not the cure. The natural history of diabetic retinopathy uh, from uh, mild to moderate and then proliferative retinopathy uh, is there, but uh, given the barriers in screening, a patient could present with any one of these stages. Similarly, when we talk about diabetic macular edema, this could occur at any time of uh, the disease process, and uh, one could have no macular edema or non-center involving macular edema, uh, 
or center involving macular edema. So the ones that we are really going to talk about are uh, severe NPDR and PDR uh, with or without diabetic macular edema. The principles of management of diabetic retinopathy are quite the same as the management of any other disease where there's the primary prevention where we're talking about the systemic control and the prevention of diabetes, secondary prevention where screening comes in, uh, and also systemic control, and then of course tertiary treatment is what we are involved with. Uh, looking at the risk factors for developing uh, diabetic eye disease and diabetic retinopathy, gender doesn't play so much of a role, but Caucasian and Amer African American descent seem to increase your chances of developing diabetic disease. Type one diabetes, uh, the length of diabetes, the poorer control of diabetes are all important. And of course, uh, less recognized but more uh, important this thing is hypertension. There are clear long-term benefits of tight control of type two diabetes, uh, but uh, one must remember that when a you know, patient comes and says, oh, I'm doing everything now to make uh, this thing better, the problem is it started long time ago. And so the body, the eye has got what we call metabolic memory. So good control right through is, is very important. But in type two diabetes, glycemic control may not be as important as in type one. In fact, intensive glycemic control of the diabetes reduces the risk of diabetic retinopathy only by 20% in type two diabetes versus 75% in type one. Maybe for type two diabetes, uh, BP control, blood pressure control might be more important because you can see that tight BP control is associated with a lower risk of progression of retinopathy, photocoagulation for the macular edema, uh, and also a reduction in vision. But this is not to say that uh, glucose control is not important, but just to show you the difference in these two graphs, in the upper and the lower, uh, uh, the lower graph, in terms of how much impact each of these things happen, uh, have. But they are, not, they are not exclusive, they are both need to be done. One of the studies I was involved with was called the FEEL study, which, which looked at a lipid-lowering drug called phenofibrate, uh, marketed as lipidil. Uh, and what we found was that the use of oral phenofibrate reduced the need for laser for diabetic macular edema uh, and PDR by almost 30%. Uh, the, what the study also showed that uh, while it reduced the risk of progression of retinopathy, it was not related to the reduction in lipids. So this obviously is an effect which takes place independent of lipid lowering, uh, uh, you know, properties of phenofibrate. Uh, it's been a, a drug used for a long time, but now I think the current guidelines for management of type two diabetes should reflect the fact that phenofibrate has a positive impact on diabetic uh, retinopathy, its progression, not only its progression, but also the development of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, and this is something that when we write to our colleagues, our endocrinologists, our GPs, one line at the bottom of the letter should just say that, would you consider starting this patient even though the lipids are all right? So our role, we normally don't interfere in the patient's uh, you know, systemic uh, medication, but our role should be to inform the patient and also perhaps let their GP know. Now coming on to the management of macular edema, this one is easy, it's an off-center macular edema. You'd say, oh, well, that's fine, but what we're talking about is, is um, uh, fovea or macular or central macular involvement macular edema. So in the old days, we moved away from the grid, we moved away from intravitreal steroids alone, uh, and now have um, moved to the right end of the, of the, of the graph where we use antivitreal, uh, in, intravitreal anti-VEGF and also intravitreal steroids. So it's gone from a time when we were talking about prevention of blindness we're talking now about improvement in vision. Of course, uh, there are, there's so much, so much in literature on the management and uh, how to give an injection, what's safe, we all know that. But I believe the one problem, it's not so much about the agent, it's about the fact that we generally tend to undertreat the patient. It, there are many barriers and, you know, cost, distance, repeated injection, patient fatigue, physician fatigue, all come in. But now with the fact that we've got an established safety of the injections, we, we are thinking of bilateral simultaneous injections, uh, we can try and sort of in, increase the uptake and also get better results. Now there are many anti-VEGFs and they're all effective in treatment of diabetic macular edema. 
Uh, what's important is what is the loading dose as compared to AMD where you tend to talk about three injections. It's quite clear from the various studies, especially protocol T, that six injections gives you the maximum, maximum treatment. And I think the main thing is to carry on with this as you go on in year one. Uh, here's standard examples you'd all be familiar with, the uh, lady with diabetes, poor vision, thick macula, and then you carry on and, and the vision comes up. Similarly, somebody with previous macular laser gets uh, possibly more severe disease, gets a later response. But the next question is, which agent do you use when? Well, what we find is that when there's good vision, there's no difference in all the three agents, your Avastin, your Aflibercept, and your Renibizumab. But in poorer vision, we find that Aflibercept has some super superiority. So when you look at uh, eyes that have got bad disease, like central hard exudates, uh, like this one, you know, poor vision, you can see that the central photoreceptors are destroyed. Uh, as we go on, such a patient, I'd prefer to use ILEA in simply because it gives you that, otherwise for, for, for mild disease, they're all the same. So you can see here after four injections of, of Flibercept, vision has improved and after nine injections, it's, it's uh, even better. When you've got a more chunky hard exudate, very often the visual result is, uh, is not as good because the outcome is determined by damage to the central uh, photoreceptors. But still, things do get better. So here are the guidelines for management of DME, which are quite uh, self-explanatory. But what you see at the bottom is that if one thing fails, you can always use the other as a rescue. The last part is the management of severe PDR. Uh, you know, it's a scary disease very often. PRP still remains the first line of treatment because it does give you long-term good results. Um, you can see that fan over there. Uh, and then with PRP, things do get better and stay uh, better for a long time. So it has excellent long-term outcomes, but then what's the role of anti-VEGFs in this? We know from uh, various studies that, uh, that anti-VEGFs are not only non-inferior, but very often at one year are superior to PRP. You can see this patient presented with a, a large NVD. A laser was done, and the same day injection was given, and two weeks later the vessels have regressed. And basically what we do is just carry on with the injections till such time you finish the laser to reduce the chance of uh, a vitreous hemorrhage. We look at the role of uh, anti vegfs in the diaptic retinopathy per se, and we find that not only does it help with the macular edema, but it also improves the status of the diaptic retinopathy. So, the, so in summary, what do we need to do? We need to tell patients that Listen, I'm, you don't say I'm only your eye doctor, you, you, you're, you're the treating eye doctor, but they need to be told that they are also part of the equation. They need to maintain their blood sugar, blood glucose, and blood lipids. And for those who don't have any problems, need to have regular eye exams. And so in conclusion, one must remember that retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy, is, uh, is a microvascular complication of diabetes, and that uh, for center involving DME, anti-VEGFs are good for severe uh, DME, a flibercept seems to have some advantage over the others. But in the real world, remember, the one big thing is under treatment. So we need to look at uh, addressing this problem and also remember that anti vegfs are now slowly expanding into the, into the armamentarium for treatment of not only macular edema but also proliferative retinopathy. Thank you. Thanks, Nitin. I think that was a wonderful overview of what is going to come in the course because we're going to have all these topics covered individually. And it's, uh, can I have my slides? Uh, so Nitin pointed out particularly that diabetes is a systemic microvascular disease and we ought to not only treat diabetic retinopathy but treat the patient as a whole. So I'll be talking on uh, just introducing the subject. Can I have the next slide? So I'm moving. So I have a, a galaxy of masters in our field. Professor Atul Kumar, who is chief of RP Center, would be talking on anti -vegis. Professor Vishali Gupta would be talking on how steroids impact uh, diabetic retinopathy. 
Anish Nagpal, you have always seen his beautiful videos. Uh, he'll be talking on vitrectomy and DME and diabetic retinopathy. Neera Sunduja, my colleague, would be talking on clinical trials and how they're relevant uh, for us uh, today. Dr. Ritu would be talking on cataract in diabetic retinopathy. Dr. Manpeet on imaging in diabetic retinopathy. And just myself, I'll be giving you the introduction and cover up a little bit about lasers. So what is the definition of diabetic macular edema? We have heard about focal maculopathy, diffuse maculopathy, and ischemic maculopathy. These terms are relevant, but, uh, and we also have heard about and learned during our post-graduation about what are the three important factors to, uh, to diagnose clinically significant macular edema. But the de definition of DME has now become so useful and simple that you either have a center involving diabetic maculopathy or you have a center involving, uh, or you have a non-center involving diabetic macular edema. Now this definition also helps us in deciding how do we go about treating uh, diabetic macular edema. A center involving diabetic macular edema, you treat with anti-VEGFs or intravitreal injections, while a non-center involving diabetic macular edema, you treat by the ETTS protocol and do laser photocoagulation. So these are the various uh, further subdivisions uh, of the macula which has helped us because all of us use OCT so regularly. So we can actually pinpoint where exactly the diabetic macula edema is located and then on a, on a, on a time span follow this uh, particular diabetic macula edema as how it is increasing or reducing. A little bit about the basics of pathogenesis. So we know that in diabetes, there is an occlusion occurring, there is leakage happening, and there is formation of microaneurysms. There is, uh, because of the leakage, there is deposition of uh, exudates within, uh, within the extracellular space. There is uh, leakage, and there is, the, from the microaneurysms, there is also bleeding which happens within the extracellular space, so we get numerous retin hemorrhages. And depending upon the layer of the retina, where these hemorrhages or exudates are located, they take a particular shape. Because of occlusion of vessels, there's formation of capillary non-perfusion, and hence ischemia, formation of vascular endothelial growth factor, which is responsible for proliferation. Now, there are other biochemical markers which are involved in diabetic macular uh, edema and in diabetic retinopathy. These are the leukocyte addition, the advanced glycation end uh, products, protein kinase C, and various other products which are important for uh, the regulation of the progression of diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema. Dr. Vishali, can you join us one more time? So uh, diabetic uh, uh, retinopathy pathophysiology, the main driving force is hyperglycemia. And there are other products which are involved like the oxidative stress, the advanced glycation end products, the PKC activation and inflammation which is an important factor for steroids. Now lasers, they affect the retinal ischemia, so you block this retinal ischemia by uh, doing photocoagulation. Then you have a reduction of inflammation, which is done by steroids. Then you have anti vegs which basically block the vascular and endothelial factor. And then you have other agents which are used uh, to some extent, and this entire pathway should be known by us when we are planning to treat patient of diabetic retinopathy. It's also important to know that uh, there, is, there are two blood retin barriers, the outer blood retin barrier which is formed by tight junctions between the retinal pigment epithelium and the inner retinal barrier which is the tight junction complexes between the retinal vascular and endothelial cells and the well differentiated network of glial cells which is present within the retinal tissue. All, both the blood retin barriers are important. There's a disruption of blood retinal barrier which causes an extravasation of fluid and intraretinal accumulation and deposition of hard exudates, which is because of damage to the tight junctions, development of microaneurysms, and a damage to capillaries, so that is called as capillaropathy. Then there are some hematological uh, uh, alterations, and it's been shown uh, consistently with numerous studies which have come out from our country as well, from PGI, uh, uh, as to what is the importance of anemia, what is the importance of the lipids, and it's important to take care of uh, um, all the systemic factors when we are going to manage diabetic retinopathy. And uh, this is some of the histological uh, mounts which show us how these microaneurysms form, how capillary non-perfusion occurs, and how this leads to formation of new vascularization. 
why they should be an algorithmic approach to management of diabetic retinopathy? That is because there are multitude of treatments available. There are uncertainties regarding what treatment to start, how to select, and how to pursue this treatment. The treatment approach needs to be individualized to each patient, and hence we have to have a step ladder pattern or a step-by-step -step approach, and that is why we have an algorithmic approach. So these are some of the algorithms which have, uh, which were uh, formulated a few years back by the Canadian Ophthalmological Society, which actually is, is very relevant, and all of you should adopt it and follow it. There are some changes which are happening regularly. So we have a definite pattern of screening of diabetic retinopathy patients where how we decide when to screen, how to screen, and how to go about following a particular set of pa patients. And this particular guideline, which is a European expert panel algorithm for treatment of diabetic macular edema, is based upon the DRCA.net classification of a center involving DME versus an extra cell uh, or an extra four wheel diabetic macular edema. So patients who have an extra four wheel involvement, you basically laser them. If you have a four wheel involvement or you have a central involvement, you treat them with anti and Professor Arthur uh, and Dr. Vishali would be covering intravitreal injections for these patients. Now, if you have patients who has a little drop in vision, you have a small cyst formation, how do you treat? And I think during the uh, course of the session, we'll be covering up these uh, uh, small examples. And here, if you have a patient who has a, 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 a microorganism which is leaking, which is away from the fovea, causing heart exudation and edema, which is formed away from the center, it is, it is quite safe enough to do laser in these patients, and these patients do actually very well. Then there's a defined uh, algorithm for treatment of proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and in cases of pregnancy, it's very important that we don't use anti in these cases. Uh, patients with DME in pregnancy should be treated either with laser if they have to be treated and maybe with steroids, but no anti at all. Now, uh, uh, just I'll briefly touch upon uh, laser photocoagulation. Basically, we th this is how we used to treat our patients, which has changed now by the, uh, by the intervention of uh, uh, anti wedges and the availability of OCT. So these are images which are prior to 2004 where we went very close to the fovea and did get good results in our patients uh, by lasering them. And this is how the world has changed from the 80s till today, how uh, different agents were introduced and how um, uh, you know, modifications have occurred over a period of time. Uh, it's also important that we treat, and these are some slides which I've borrowed from Dr. Mangat, of the importance of metabolic control. You can see here, this is the patient which was preoperatively in the right eye, the left eye, and this is the situation of the patient post-treatment uh, uh, about six months later, how beautifully the, the, the macular edema has dissolved, and this patient had refused any intervention, was just controlled metabolically, so that is the importance of metabolic control. For paucity of time, I'll, I'll just rush through this part. And this patient actually was first seen in the clinic, um, ha, did not know that patient was diabetic, was sent to nephrology, put on dialysis. Eight months later, the macular architecture had been restored significantly. So these are some of the guidelines by the American Diabetic Association. This is how we used to laser our patients. We also la used to laser our patients by a, by, um, 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 by, by a grid the photocoagulation, and uh, this we still do for, patient, for patients who have an extra foveal uh, edema which is not involving the fovea at all. And uh, uh, for proliferative diabetic retinopathy, a pan photocoagulation is still the treatment of choice, which can be combined with anti wedges which uh, Professor Atul be, will be in, uh, covering. But in our context, in our country, laser has a role to play in cases of uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So now I'll invite Dr. Neeraj to uh, give us talk on what we have learned from clinical trials.
good morning everyone um, i will be speaking on about various clinical trials which were conducted uh, in treatment of diabetic retinopathy initial clinical trials history dates back to 1976 when diabetic retinopathy study trial came followed by uk pds etdrs drvs and dcct as far as the systemic control is concerned diabetes control and complication trial uh, clearly showed if you are controlling Uh, blood sugar with intensive insulin therapy the chances of progression of diabetic retinopathy decreases by 54% other trials also euclid's uk pds accord and field trials they showed if you are controlling blood sugar blood pressure and cholesterol definitely it is going to be in the central in the management of diabetic retinopathy you look at this gentleman 60 year old diabetic for the last 13 years hbmc not under control vision 636 and after good metabolic control how the picture changes in 3 months time only good metabolic control and that is what we exactly emphasize in our clinical practice also diabetic retinopathy study uh, showed if you do laser photocoagulation to high risk pdr cases the chances of progression to severe visual loss decreases by 50% ETDRS gave us uh, the guidelines of treating diabetic macular edema they defined clinically significant macular edema and the focal laser what we do practically in our scenario for uh, the macular edema which is not involving the center of fovea and also it showed aspirin use is not going to worsen your diabetic retinopathy it can be used safely look at this picture what we learned from this ETDRS study focal macular edema and after doing laser photocoagulation the macular edema has decreased so that is what we practically do uh, as far as the laser treatment is concerned we were just telling patient like your vision loss is not going to be there but we are not talking in terms of improvement of vision so the treatment uh, protocol shifted to pharmacotherapy and uh, surgical approaches uh, i'll be discussing a uh, few trials which were done to treat the diabetic macular edema and diabetic retinopathy center involvement diabetic macular edema result trial was done to see the efficacy of ranibizumab 0.3 mg and 0.5 mg uh, in treatment of uh, diabetic macular edema and the dose was increased after one month if the patient was not responding and photocoagulation was done after three injections if required and you can see with all pooled ranibizumab data 0.3 and 0.6 that there was a gain of 9.6 let us compare to the sham group and the mean retinal thickness also decreased considerably which was there over 12 months time with repeated injections and mean number of injections or 10 injections in the first one year you can see and uh, there was gain of uh, 10.3 let us in visual equity and th there was less requirement for rescue laser therapy who received wedge wedge of monotherapy anti wedge of monotherapy and also it showed us like whether we can use this uh, anti wedge of drug safely in patients with cardiovascular and cerebrovascular accident because there was no increased risk of any uh, non ocular uh, side effects and any adverse event restore study also told us like uh, if you are doing uh, ranibizumab monotherapy or whether you are combining with laser or you are doing just laser monotherapy and the injections were given at 3 months interval until the disease was stabilized and there was improvement of more than 10 letters who patients who received whether uh, uh, monotherapy or in conjunction with laser treatment so there was a clear cut benefit in compared to the only 15% with laser monotherapy bold study evaluated the role of bevacizumab in treatment of diabetic macular edema and there was gain of 8 letters so this drug was also effective and this drug was given at 6 weeks interval Read to study uh, studied the role of grid laser alone, ranibizumab alone, and ranibizumab combined with grid laser to see whether laser alone is going to be more helpful or in combination with the ranibizumab. In this study, there was a clear cut visual gain in uh, ranibizumab uh, treated patients, and the patient who received laser also to ranibizumab, there was decreased in the number of frequency of injections to be given, which was which is a very important message we got. though the ultimate visual outcome was better slightly better the patients who received only uh, monotherapy davinci studied uh, study conducted uh, was uh, to do uh, see the effect of aflibercept in diabetic macular edema and there was clear cut visual gain in this uh, anti wedge also retain study is very pertinent in our scenario uh, this was basically a treat and extend treatment approach to the diabetic macular edema patients patients were random uh, randomized into treat and extend ranibizumab 0.5 mg with laser and only ranibizumab treat and extend and uh, ranibizumab on uh, prn basis what uh, usually we do and 
uh, in this study, if you see, there were three injections which were given at one month interval. After that, if the macular edema came down to uh, normal foveal contour, decrease in macular edema, patient having good vision, even then the next injection was given at uh, from the two month in interval from the last third injection. And then uh, after that, if the macula was dry, even then uh, injections were given after uh, the th in the third month. So you can see that we were increasing the gap between the injections. Patient is coming regularly, but what gain we are getting from this doing this? Uh, it was seen whether you're doing treat and extend, whether you're doing PRN basis, uh, whether you're combining laser, all patients were having good visual outcome. But the gain was there was less than 40% reduction in the uh, patient visit to your hospital by doing treat and extend regime. And more than 74% of the patients were maintaining good vision uh, when they were following up uh, more than two months interval, which was not happening in, uh, in PRN basis. So treat and extend regime attempts to minimize the number of clinic visits, number of injections, and overall a patient is getting benefited. Protocol T was head to head trial of aflibercept, bevacizumab, and ranimuzumab, all anti vegf drugs we use in our clinical scenario. And you can see uh, in aflibercept, the visual gain was much more, 13.3 letters, compared to the ranimuzumab and least in bevacizumab group. And the foveal thickness also was increasing more in aflibercept group. But in this scenario, the dose which was used in uh, safety was all, all were good, but the dose which was used was 0.3 milligram which is less than what we use in our clinical scenario, 0.5 milligram. So this was a confounding factor in the results of this study with the gap of uh, uh, ranibuzumab and aflibercept. Protocol I was uh, study done to see the evaluate of laser, ranibuzumab, and trimsulonone. And intravitreal ranibuzumab with prompt or deferred laser had a superior visual outcome compared with the focal or grid laser. And this study gave us clear-cut message in pseudophagic eyes, intravitreal samsalone with prompt laser may be equally effective as renewable. And uh, one more thing was very interesting in this study. There were around one-third of patients who did not improve, uh, who do, did not have good effect uh, of visual improvement and reduced ret uh, retinal thickness at three months after giving three injections. And these patients, they continued to maintain less vision over 52 weeks time, you can say three years time. So this was very important message. If the patient is not responding to your early treatment with three injections, you may switch to another therapy. Protocol U was an evaluation of dexamethasone, ranibuzumab uh, versus ranibuzumab alone for CSME. Uh, this study showed like if you're combining both the things, the visual outcome is not at all different from if you're giving monotherapy. Ozodex, uh, various studies were done, Mead, Mozart, Champlain, and Placid. Uh, this study showed uh, the 700 microgram uh, dexamethasone implant was quite effective in visual game. And it, uh, intraocular pressure raised high was not at all concern in most of the patients. And mean of like 4.1 injections uh, were required in, uh, sorry. And over three years, you can see 4.1 injections are required in three years' time. And DRCR net protocol study showed the role of uh, anti vegf drugs versus prompt laser we do for uh, PDR. And it showed renewable tre treatment resulted in greater, greater mean, uh, mean visual equity gain over two years' time, but the cost is a constraint in our scenario. So this thing has been covered by Dr. Ajay. Uh, and uh, we t decide about the treatment continuation interruption and reinitiation based on mainly on the visual equity and to some extent uh, corroborated with OCT pictures. And if the patient shows visual worsening or period of time, you can see this patient uh, gave three, given three injections, edema is still persisting, and we gave Ozodex, the vision improved from 630 to 612. So it is very important to switch early before the permanent structural damage sets in. So, and ideal situation for dexamethasone implant is pseudophagic eyes uh, where systemic contraindication is there and early switch in non-responder non pregnant patients and patient is unable to come for monthly injection of anti vegf therapy. So to conclude, the studies of DRCR net, read, rise, restore, Darwincy, they are providing basis for evidence-based clinical practice in DME and the gold standard for treating DME has shifted from laser photocoagulation to pharmacotherapy. Thank you. Neeraj, we'll have questions at the end of the session. So all the maze of all these studies which uh, Neeraj has covered, uh, the next three speakers will, you know, unfold, uh, unravel this maze.
Professor Atul will be talking on anti-VEGF, then Dr. Vishali and Manish. Thank you, Ajay, for inviting me to your course. And I'm very honored to be here in Coimbatore and also for your course, which is on diabetic retinopathy, a very major cause of blindness in our country, often because the physician doesn't realize that the attending physician or the endocrinologist doesn't realize the eyes also get affected. It's as bad as that. So when they realize that the eyes also, sometimes we have patients with diabetic foot. Uh, recently we had a patient with diabetic foot, an a a A1C of 11.3, and he didn't ever have an eye examination. And he had the most severest form of the high risk characteristics PDR. The total retina ischemia, only a fibrovascular growth from the disc. So such kind of patients, you can't offer much in the form of surgery or laser or anti -vegif. So it's important that we should also uh, counsel our co colleagues. So anti play a major role, as uh, just now Neeraj has said. It's uh, been proven by numerous trials, significantly positive anatomical results, both the visual and anatomical. Undoubtedly, anti of therapy has assumed an important role in the management of adaptic macular edema, either as a first choice, which is more likely, or as an adjuvant to laser. Now, this is the kind of a picture we see with adaptic macular edema. You will see center involving edema or non central involving edema. It's a central involving edema which we are more bothered about because that's the one which affects the vision directly. That's the one which responds to anti -VEGF. Off center, beyond one millimeter, zone then you may even consider laser or you can do an anti vegf followed by laser but there are uh, you know you don't have to directly go for laser if the edema is very uh, if the retina is very edematous so i just want to tell you a little bit about dme uh, because in the from the point of view anti vegf that white field imaging is very very useful we have a talk on that this white field imaging tells you about the peripheral ischemia and this peripheral ischemia is picked up very well a num number of studies have sa said that by doing the white field uh, ischemia, you actually, 80% of the recalcitrant edema is because of the white field, uh, because of the ischemia in the periphery. So it's very important to pick up the peripheral ischemia. Now I'll come to the very, very important study, the protocol T, which is also dubbed as a CAT trial for DME. DME. The CAT trial was actually for AMD for ranibizumab versus Avastin. But it, it, this can be extrapolated to protocol T, which is drcr.net diaptic retinopathy, because this also did a head-to-head -head, uh, comparative trial of not two drugs. There it was Avastin in ARMD for versus Veranibizumab. All the centers here, there are three drugs. You all know the three drugs. It's basically Avastin again, the centers again, the common anti -vegifs, and we've added Ilia, which is aflibercept. The doses are as per the clinical recommendations. Interestingly, in two years, vision improved in all three groups half of the number of injections and slightly decreased frequency of visits in the second year. That means if you got four injections the first year, two in the second. The efficacy of all the three anti vegfs was extremely high. Lights gone off here. Are we on? So uh, efficacy of only one patient, uh, very interestingly, only one patient switched drugs. You only switch drugs when you find that the response is not very equivocal or poor. That is a recalcitrant. So in, in this study, of all the patients in three groups, only one switched drugs at one year. There's a decreased amount of focal grid laser in the second year for all the three agents. So decreased uh, laser, decreased number of injections, decreased number of frequency of visits, Everything goes in favor of the patient. And so this is the kind of edema which you can have and uh, you can see the amount of edema over here which is totally flattened out, the OCT pictures along with. So this is just a little bit about uh, what the graphs show that in the vision, when the vision was uh, poorer than 20 by 50, 20 by 50 is something like 618. If it was less than 618, then aflibercept did the best. But if it was less than 612, 612, 618, if the vision was less or better, better than 612, then they found that ranibizumab actually had a letter visual acuity, ETDRS letter visual acuity, better than even aflibercept. So all in all, aflibercept and ILIA did equally well. And in, in our practice at RP Center, we generally prefer prescribing as a first-line drug ranibizumab. You don't want to go to the last 
and then uh, with the we have a with the with the if liver sept because we feel we rather keep it for cases of recalcitrant we feel lucentis is good enough and that's what we are following because that's what the protocol t says now the protocol s is the last which i'd like to tell you it's a non inferior uh, non inferiority trial it was found to be non inferior to prp in pdris and at 2 years so at 2 years visual acuity improved by 2.5 letters you see here from the baseline in the ranibizumab group and 2.2 letters from baseline in the prp group here it seems as if ranibizumab is going to do wonders but it's not that um, with the mean difference of this thing now this study had sort of caveats that patient has to come back for a follow up after one month if he doesn't then his pdr uh, uh, will go worse it's not dme it's pdr it's a big it's a you study the volcano if the patient has to come back after one year one month if he doesn't come back after one month his pdr will progress and he will bleed so every patient has to come back and then there's more field loss with uh, ranibizumab but interestingly more vitrectomies were performed in the prp group with 15% of eyes requiring vitrectomy compared to 4%. That means the anti vegf group required less vitrectomies. Probably we brought down the shrunk, shrunk and uh, the fibrovascular neovascular growth came down because of anti vegf So it was easier to do the vitrectomy here. The active fibrovascular growth came down. Something we do preoperative vascular vitreous surgery. So this is now I'm coming to the last two slides to make points, to ponder points to think when you go back. A patient, diabetes mellitus for He's got diabetes mellitus of five years, uncontrolled, OD is 636, OS is 624, FAS is intact, status post, multiple anti vegfs FA shows NVD, NVE, capillary non-fusion areas, FAS is intact, there is a certain amount of serous fluid over here, OCTA shows new raised or flat new association over the disc, and you can see the OCT over here uh, shows uh, in the le in the left eye shows this is the right eye showed some fibrovascular growth over here we're not very uh, angry looking so here we have a patient whose FAS is intact so the macular function is re uh, relatively good there is no absence of drill drill is not uh, present so yeah I'll just finish in this last minute this warning bell so in this one minute I'm definitely going to finish so this is a drill which is absent, that means you can make out the inner retinal layers. And therefore, the patient has fast intact, so what should we do? This is one patient. The other patient is a patient who came to us with 20 years standing, A1C 8.5, and uh, he had a center involving DME 616. Now, this is the kind of edema he had. He had a fibrovascular growth here. And over here, we found over here, you see here, it's an enlarged fast. It's going over 1,000, 1,700 nearly. So this is a very large pass. Now, generally, pass should be taken from the deeper, deeper capillary plexus of the OCTA. So when you do the OCTA, the deeper capillary plexus, but the superficial, so the pass was enlarged. So what I'm trying to say is the ETDRS, all these studies haven't taken pass into consideration when they've decided about anti of therapy, good vision, bad vision is based only on ET ETDRS, or good vision, bad vision is based on ETDRS, and central uh, macular thickening. But fast characteristics would make it a very important use, uh, additional point to decide whether you want to give anti vegf because in a ischemic macula, would you like to give an anti vegf or not is a big question mark. So in the final, I just want to say, this is my last slide, that I would rather say that have a hybrid approach for anti vegf initially for three injections followed by PRP for long-term stability. That means you have a PDRI like this, he do his FA, this is a picture, PDR. So give him an anti vegf three. Three shots of anti vegf every monthly. Then do targeted scatter laser. Targeted would mean that you'll do laser only at the areas which are ischemic or leaky. That means don't blast the whole retina totally like scatter because that decreases the contrast. Dark adaptation, patient cannot drive at night. Color vision goes down. The driving at night becomes dark adaptation, very severely affected, loss of accommodation. So don't put PRP all over. You have the areas which are which are having ischemia, you just cover it. So what we did with the Pascal laser is we put laser spots all over here. And this edema has gone down with ranibizumab and targeted laser photograph. This is my approach now we'd like to do at RP Center. We do com combination, not follow protocol less blindly, anti vegf anti vegf anti vegf So we'll put three, do targeted laser, then follow up the patient after two or three months. Thank you very much. So I think the last slide of Dr. Atul was very, very important. And maybe in the end 10 minutes we'll discuss. Now I invite Dr. Vishali to talk on 
uh, steroids in DMA and PDR, when, how, and what to expect out of it. Thank you, Ajay, for this wonderful opportunity. <coughs> now, I shall be talking about corticosteroids. Corticosteroids mainly have a role in macular edema and not much for proliferative. So I'll be generally talking about macular edema. A big question which most of us ask is anti-VEGF. We all know center involving DME, we inject. But do you keep on injecting, hoping that the macular edema will resolve maybe after seventh or eighth injection, or do you take a vein check at three injections, and if the patient is not responding to anti-VEGF, switch over to corticosteroid. I'll give you a situation. This is the OCT. You can see there are large spaces, fluid-filled cavities. There is fluid, and you can look at the photoreceptors there I mean, they are under stress. They are detached for quite some time. So patient has <coughs> already received three injections of anti-VEGF. The big question is, would you add steroids or would you still continue with anti-VEGF? Now, before we go ahead, let's answer a very basic, simple question. Is macular edema caused only by VEGF? Not really. Uh, diabetes affect all cell types. It affects retinal vessels. A lot of attention is paid to this aspect, choroid, glial cells, and neuronal cells. So what happens is when there is chronic hyperglycemia, there is loss of retinal capillary endothelial cell type junctions. We all understand it very well. This causes two kinds of reaction. It produces inflammatory mediators as well as VEGF. Both of them increase the permeability and the macular edema. However, when we are treating, most of our focus is on this leg and we tend to ignore this part of the treatment many a time. So coming back to the same that once the permeability is broken and there is the cytokine exposition, it is a kind of a vicious cycle. So <coughs> sorry about this. Even if you are taking care of anti-VEGF, you still have a lot of inflammatory mediators which are further increasing the capillary permeability and contributing towards the development of more macular edema. Besides the retinal capillary permeability, we also have retinal microglia and macroglia. And these glial cells become activated by hyperglycemia. They respond to the stress and they also produce TNF, interleukins, and VEGF. Now, when we are giving VEGF, VEGF is not taking care of these cytokines because these cytokines are attracting more cells uh, which are coming to the retina. So there is a very interesting study which I personally liked a lot. This was about studying the phenotype. I won't go into the details, but if you have the macular edema, which is the leaky variety, which is the mostly diffuse or the serous, this is mostly increased due to eye cam, whereas the ischemic is the one where VEGF levels are very high. And you can see once you inject VEGF into the eye, you end up with ischemia and microaneurysms, which means when you are treating with anti-VEGF, you'll be able to take care of this component, but the other component, which is breakdown in the blood retinal barrier, is mainly driven by non-VEGF components, which we need to take care of by giving corticosteroids. 
So we come back to our basic question, persistent edema after three injections, what are the possibilities? One, this phenotype being treated may not be VEGF driven because there are cytokines which are working. There are mediators other than VEGF which are not being targeted, hence you have edema. And anti-VGF on their own are not able to improve the drainage are reduce the swelling of retinal lunar cells. So they need a bit of help. And that help would come with the introduction of injection of corticosteroids. Protocol I uh, was d done, uh, carried out to assess whether early response to anti-VEGF after three injections can predict long-term treatment outcome in diabetic macular edema. So very interestingly, what they showed, they showed that after three injections, whatever improvement in the vision occurs, that is what stays on the long-term period, which means that if after three injections, you are not having improvement, you are not likely to have improvement in the long term. So probably this is a time to switch over the therapy from anti-VEGF to steroids. This is an example of a patient here. <coughs> I showed you in the beginning. So you can see here, there is a breakdown of the blood retinal barrier. There is this, so he received an implant at this stage. And you can see three weeks later, vision improved to 2030. And there was a good response to steroid at this stage. Subsequently, he was actually mani uh, maintained on anti-VEGF injections and this is 18 months later with the vision of 2030 being maintained. So etiology, we all understand, is multifactorial. So anything which has a multifactorial etiology, treating it with monotherapy, talking only about anti-VEGF injection, even the common sense defies it. If the etiology is multifactorial, the treatment has to be multifactorial. The second role of... Uh, um, implants which we use is at the time of surgery. This is an example of a patient who has vitreo macular traction, undergoes surgery, and three months post-op, you can still see the residual spaces. However, this is an another patient who has TPHM, undergoes surgery, along with steroid implant, and within two weeks, you can have a very quick post-op rehabilitation. And the last leg is to minimize the progression of diabetic retinopathy following post cataract surgery. We are injecting steroid implant and we have recently completed a series, very large series of 140 patients with good positive result. This is an example of a patient before and this is after cataract surgery. So conclude, steroids do have a definitive role to play in the management of diabetic retinopathy. Um, you have to customize every patient rather than following the trials because uh, when you are sitting in the clinic, patients honestly, believe me, do not follow the clinical trial patients. So I think customization is very important. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Vishali, since you're going, I have one question for you. Are there any OCT markers which make you decide that steroids may be the primary agent to use and not anti -vegif. The moment I see a large uh, serous detachment, that is one of the reasons. The choroid which is swollen, many a times with the swept source OCT, now you see the choroidal permeability is increased. So increase in choroidal permeability, presence of serous detachment, huge cystic spaces, uh, cystoid spaces, so these are some of the parameters are pseudophagia. These are the four uh, parameters where we use steroids sometimes as a first line of therapy. Would you think in such a situation, maybe in future supracholateral injection may be useful? It may be. We do not have much experience on it. Thank you. Can I have Dr. Mantri Bella talking to us on imaging and diabetic retinopathy? Good morning, all. And before I begin, a big thank you to Dr. Rajay for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I'll be taking you through the diagnostics. 
uh, coming beginner, this fundus fluorescein angiography, as we all know, uh, it's detection of your retinal vessel by photographing the retina once you inject fluorescein dye into your peripheral veins. And how does it reach your eye? Once you inject it into the vein, it goes through your heart, internal carotid, ophthalmic artery, and then into your central retinal artery in short tissue. So coming to the role of fluorescein in diabetic retinopathy, one important thing to remember is that it is not a screening test, so it should not be used in patients with no or minimal diabetic retinopathy. And so where exactly should it be used? Uh, we'll go through some clinical examples and you'll be probably much more clearer after that. So this is case one. You can clearly see that the left eye has got a tractional retinal detachment and the right fundus shows a neovascularization and uh, the changes because of diabetes. So once you run your angiography, uh, it helps you to classify and confirm that the type of proliferative disease that you have. The here it has got a high risk PDRs and it helps you to decide the urgency of your laser treatment. And also it gives a lot of information about your macula. Important thing to remember is not to ignore the macula when you start doing your PRPs as you can really worsen the diabetic macular edema. So identify your MAs, identify your areas of non-perfusion, do your GRID or anti vegf combined when you are dealing with a proliferative diabetic disease. Why is it important to repeat your angiography after you complete your laser? That is to confirm regression. Only one third of the eyes, they show successful regression of NVEs following a three st standard three or four sessions of your PRP. So if you notice that after um, your three sessions of PRP, a patient has persistent NVEs, it's important to augment your PRP before you re uh, reach a silent looking retina like that. Um, another role is to basically differentiate whether you're dealing with a case of a severe or a proliferative disease. Here in the early frames, you can see there are some intraretinal microvascular abnormalities, probably a blocked fluorescence from a hemorrhage. And once you go to the late frames, there is hardly any leakage. So it confirms that this is intraretinal microvascular changes rather than a neovascularization. So there is absolutely no need to start your PRP at this stage. Coming to diabetic macular edema, so there are three different situations. Your OCT shows intraretinal fluid in all three, but your FFA will give you a completely different picture. So this is case one. He has these leaky microaneurysms, CNP, and this is a non-centered DME. Few MAs which are very close to your fovea. So important thing to know is that focal laser has to be done to your leaking microaneurysms. You can do a little grid to your non-perfusion, but remember uh, not to treat within the first, within 500 microns of your central fovea. So these MAs should not be ideally touched. So this is case two, the patient has received macular laser in the past. Um, so do we really need to do an angiography here also? The answer is probably yes. As once you run your angiography, what you notice is that these are the areas which has been previously treated. And now this is the area of leaking microaneurysms, which is causing fluid on your OCT. So FFA is helpful to assess the adequacy of your previous macular laser treatment. Um, coming to ischemic maculopathy here, your uh, OCT shows intraretinal edema. There are a lot of hard exudates on your OCT, on, on your color picture. But um, as soon as you run your angiography, you notice that here you're dealing with an ischemic macula. So does really anything have a role? That's a big question. So take home message so far is that FFA is important at your baseline to identify ischemia, focal or diffuse leaks. It helps you to plan the treatment, what to treat and what not to treat. And it's also important after the laser to assess the adequacy of your treatment. So moving on to ultra wide field FFAs. This is a traditional seven field photography, which is gonna capture around 75 degrees of your retina. When you do um, an ultra wide field, you'll be able to get around 200 degrees. That's gonna cover around 82.5% of your retina. So what can be easily missed on the traditional photography can now be picked on your ultra wide fields. It has been um, proven so far that the detection of NVE and CNP is increased by around 10% by using these ultra wide fields. And this is a very similar, this is a very 
um, normal picture that everybody is used to see. It's of an optical coherence tomography with some morphological assessment of the retina. Uh, coming to its use in uh, diabetics, it's mainly to evaluate any um, unexplained visual acuity loss. It helps you to monitor your treatment and it also helps you to identify the areas of VMT. This is a st standard OCT classification that all of us must be aware of. So I'll be skipping up these two ones. Coming to the clinical cases. So this is case one. Uh, color picture doesn't really show much except a leaky, probably a small microneurism in the right eye. And he's been a diabetic for the last 12 years. So as soon as you run your OCT, you can pick up these small little cystic pockets and a uh, central foveal thickness is increased to around 300 microns. So OCT is useful to detect early diabetic macular edema. This is another typical patient of uh, proliferative disease with very clear carpetaloid leakage coming up as a CSME. But as soon as you run your OCT, you figure out that you're dealing with something more than just a CSME. And so this patient also has a VMT. So absolutely no role of anti and this he has to undergo a vitrectomy along with or in combination with either an implant, uh, osidex implant, or with an anti -vegif. This is the post-PPV scan. Now you can carry on with your further management of diabetic edema. So OCT is important to identify your VMT and also to monitor your treatment responses. So the first picture shows a pre anti injection OCT. As soon as you do an anti you can see the serous fluid is disappearing. Your intraretinal fluid is settling down, so you are on the right track. The another way of to monitor is to look at the automated values, which some people would like to follow. So from 305 microns, you are down to 260, uh, suggesting that OCT helps you to monitor. So this is the last part, which is OCT angio. It's a non-invasive test. Um, it gives you um, individual vascular plexes separately. These are the advantages and disadvantages. And uh, so this is a montage. If you run a clear-cut uh, standard fluorescein, you can pick up multiple NVEs. And as soon as you uh, perform an OCT montage using 12 by 12 mm pixelate, you can very clearly pick up a similar amount of uh, NVEs. So there is, uh, it seems that there's probably a little role of fluorescein left at this moment. Another patient's NVD very clearly seen. Um, another usefulness is to monitor the response. It's a big front of NVE in the figure A. As soon as you treat, you can follow it up on OCT angio. That clearly shows a lot of regression and a lot of pruning of the particular vessel. Uh, not always useful. I'll be wrapping in the next one minute, if that's okay, sir. So there are leaky microneurisms, but your OCT angio doesn't really give a very clear cut picture, as there's a lot of masking happening because of the hard exudates. So future is bright, and we'll leave it for the next day I will stop. Thank you. Thanks, Manpreet. Join us on the dais, Manpreet. Must come back. Thanks for those lovely images. I request Dr. Manish now to talk on vitrectomy uh, in diabetic retinopathy, and I'll ask Dr. Ritu to come and join us on the dais. She'll be giving the last talk on cataract in diabetic retinopathy. Uh, thank you, Ajay, for the kind invitation. There have been some lovely talks setting up a lot of foundations for the surgical part because a uh, lot of things have to be looked at before you get into the surgical component. So come to the coming to the point, uh, the indications for surgery in, in diabetic macular edema specifically are usually either there's blood blocking the view, uh, covering the macula, or if there's a prying fraction, how we saw in the previous talk uh, on the OCTs, a thick hyaloid which causes traction and epiretinal membrane or a chronic uh, non-responsive edema. And of course, the regular indications of a vitreous hemorrhage not clearing and, and a gross CRDs are always there. But before you embark on surgery, again from the previous talk, I think it's important for us to look at uh, the OCT features, which of course help us uh, reach the diagnosis that this patient needs surgery or an injection or a laser. And uh, of course, helps us determine the prognostic component also. And also the fluorescein angiography from the prognostic part that you you have a VMT and you operate, but if you have uh, a, a very bad ischemia, you're not going to gain much uh, uh, prognostically. So one has to always know what uh, you counsel the patient for when you take them for surgery, because not every traction is going to uh, have a good FAZ uh, as well. 
Now coming to the surgical part, this is uh, one of the indications of a large subhyaloid hemorrhage which is blocking uh, the macular area and becomes a classic indication, one of the most common indications for uh, any surgery that we do for diabetic cases. So here uh, it's a subhyaloid hemorrhage. We are trying to explore <coughs> a gap in the hyaloid so that we can aspirate the blood underneath. And you can see that I'm trying to pull uh, on the tissue uh, which is the hyaloid and uh, still uh, the separation uh, is not taking place and so it's probably what we call the vitreoschisis. Um, uh, Cyrus many times talks about it that the vitreous is always not on one plane and the attachment it takes place and probably has sheets and so what I was initially pulling was was one part of the sheet and so now we decide to go back uh, and explore the, the actual hyaloid and now you can see the different uh, that previously what we were doing was splitting just uh, the gel itself and now you get a plane into the, the rest of the area so you can remove the hyaloid uh, gently. Uh, in diabetic cases hyaloid should always be gently removed because uh, there are attachments all over the place there are they will start bleeding or a break may form based on the adhesion. So unlike a macular hole surgery uh, or a, a pucker surgery where you do the hyaloid straight off, one has to be <coughs> very careful when you do these uh, cases. Um, after that, it's much easier. Once the hyaloid is gone, you can um, passively or actively aspirate the subhyaloid hemorrhage, which is fortunately always in a, in a liquid state, fluid state, not clotted uh, in the true sense. And then you have the the classic VMTs or spanning membranes which are there, which nowadays with our cutters which are getting more and more refined, uh, the port getting closer to the shaft allows us to go and use. So you use a mixture of a forceps and a cutter to do most of your cutting uh, in today's times and only in very complex situations would you uh, probably use bimanuality uh, in, in those situations. So. Uh, so this is how, and also Ajay put in a context of uh, how much to do. So it's not that in every case I would go to remove uh, every uh, every aspect of the, the the hyaloid or edema in these cases. This is a one-eyed patient who comes to you like this. I think uh, I w in this case I've left it by only doing this dissection because all this looks so adherent that I know that I may do more harm in the long run if I go after every aspect of it. So, so how much is also important in a lot of these cases. <coughs> This is another case you can see a, a chronic edema, uh, traction all set in. You can see the almost the cystoid spaces are there. Uh, these become tricky because uh, you can de-roof these areas when you're doing your peeling or removing the traction and one has to be very uh, careful and always do it under very high magnification so that you can see the planes uh, much better. Don't uh, do the rest of it in white field but when you come down to the basic dissection near the fovea, uh, switch to a high mag lens so that uh, all the planes are well defined and the scope of error uh, becomes less in these cases. So gently segment and cut, find the openings, diathermize wherever you feel that uh, the, the tissue has a bleeder involved or you anticipate a bleed. It's better to diathermize anticipated bleeders rather than wait for it to bleed and then, then contain them uh, at that stage. So here you can see that we've gently removed all the, the tissue overlying that area and after that we stain and and remove the ILM and even the ILM removal in these cases has to be gently done and at times you may want to leave the ILM uh, just over this very thin cystoid space also uh, if, if uh, you feel that it may de-roof uh, that particular area. <coughs> this is to discuss just the technique that if you have a proliferation uh, all localized to the posterior pole and, and uh, not very thickly adherent, you can take your fine cutters close to it and and, and try to find a plane in between the, the membrane, the proliferation sheets and the retina. And, and here we use the proportional reflux component of the machine, uh, which where you push in some fluid and it creates a plane uh, and, and you can keep increasing that plane and explore uh, and segment it. So I'll, I'll fast forward it gently that we keep on finding a plane and then cutting and leaving small micro stumps at the end uh, and one doesn't need to do uh, anything else because some of these if you take a forceps and peel it may be more uh, uh, difficult to do that at times because with the cutter you, you you know that where you where the pull seems to be uh, it's too adherent too resistant you just go and cut it and leave a stump in that particular area. <coughs> this is to show you um, the people talk of inside out delamination outside in delamination I don't follow a particular strategy I just go in and see ergonomically where in that particular case what 
what is best suited uh, at, at that moment and you can see in this case you, uh, we initially we do the core vitrectomy and try to find a plane in the center but uh, then you go to the periphery clear up all the blood and and then as you clear you find a plane in the peripheral part which you can then uh, circumferentially uh, kind of bring it from the inferior part and then go circumferentially all the way and the plane keeps uh, expanding so at times you will find that these adhesions they look uh, pretty bad but when when you start peeling them they will come through and once you have a good plane the whole sheet will come out uh, in block uh, which which becomes easier for you to handle at the end uh, of the of the surgery chronic cystadedema is is also one of the indications for um, uh, the surgery where you don't see a traction the indication is not because of any traction or whatever so this is because the edema you've been treating it with multiple injections and nothing's coming out of it every time there's a recurrence so at some point you do and some of these cases have a thick hyaloid sheet uh, some of them just have an ilm which you need to uh, remove and then at the end of the surgery we usually inject an ozodex um, because uh, eventually the the, uh, the whole stagnation is removed and you want a drug to go and uh, you know in a, in a proper manner over the next 2 3 months keep the edema control so so these are indications for the chronic uh, component which are there i'll just uh, go through this small study we presented at asrs uh, uh, briefly that i'm sure all of you face it any case of which is hemorrhage uh, we did it for all vascular etiologies but our major component was diabetic that if you have a vitreous hemorrhage that you're operating you don't know how the macula is uh, and then we kind of go in and clear up all the hemorrhage now at the end of follow up you may get this fantastic result now this eye has a cystoid edema this eye is flat uh, because on table we are interested in clearing the media doing a good laser uh, but we can't monitor we don't have uh, unless you do an intraoperative OCT you really don't know how the macula is so we've been um, uh, injecting anti vegfs at the end of uh, most of our surgeries for diabetic cases or even other vascular conditions and we compared a uh, whole chunk of eyes where we didn't give the injection versus where we gave the injections and these were non complicated which is hemorrhages without trd uh, so for example a case like this you clear up everything and at the end of surgery you've done a good laser uh, and and after that you go ahead and um, inject uh, uh, anti vegf at the end of surgery and leave it this is uh, as simple as that and we did find there was a significant uh, difference in the groups uh, where we had injected the anti vegf and after the on the one month two month follow ups there was a larger percentage of patients which had cystoid edemas in this group versus the one apart from also the lowering of incidence of post op uh, uh, recurrent vitreous hemorrhages in these cases so i thought i'll share this with you because uh, having uh, anti vegf like avastin uh, is a very useful tool for most of your vitrectomies once you've done a good clean up good laser just inject it at the end of surgery and you'll probably get a much better uh, effect in the long run than having just cleared up the media and, and laser thank you very much thanks manish i'll ask dr ritu to come up for her talk this is the last talk and then we can have four or five minutes for uh, discussion so while she starts her talk uh, i think what uh, manish has just shared the last study stanley chang almost about 10 years back used to routinely do uh, at the end of uh, surgery in diabetics to inject anti vegfs and he believed that helps in these patients good morning everyone uh, my respected co panelists and uh, dear friends i'll be talking about the management of cataract and diabetes the previous speakers have it's not working my previous speakers have already elaborated on the burden of uh, diabetes and diabetic retinopathy and this is definitely a glo uh, global epidemic as we know that uh, uh, cataracts are 2 to 5 times more common in diabetic patients they develop tend to develop more rapidly they tend to occur at a younger age and in fact 25% of all your cataract patients are likely to be diabetics in india as we know every fourth person is a diabetic now in order to optimize the visual outcome of cataract surgery our diabetic patients need special attention now what can be the indications of cataract surgery in your diabetic patients either the patient has an advanced cataract or there is poor visualization as the uh, speakers have already said you need to follow up the retina regularly it may be a part of your vr surgery which is making your view difficult 
or the patient may have an associated glaucoma. So what are our main concerns? W as we know, uh, post-op CME is more common in diabetic patients. There can be a worsening of your diabetic macular edema or a progression to uh, PDR. These patients are more prone to inflammation as we've already known about the uh, uh, markers which are there in these patients. There's a risk of infection, especially in patients who are poorly controlled. And the surgery on the whole is much more challenging. We need to look into the comorbidities which are there and manage these well preoperatively, intraoperatively, and post-op. Now, the systemic um, uh, features need to be taken care of. You need to take a proper history and find out whether your patients have any associated nephropathy, cardiopathy, or neuropathy. And this may should be taken care of preoperatively. If your patients have uh, are on dialysis, then it's always better to plan your cataract surgery a day after and make sure that the serum electrolytes, especially which may get uh, deranged, are under control. You may need to uh, avoid certain nephrotoxic drugs or avoid dimox in such patients. The metabolic control has already been uh, spoken by Dr. Nitin Varma, the importance of controlling your blood sugar, and not only that, but also your lipid profile, taking care that the BP is under well control. And if a patient has been following up with you for a while and you know he may need a cataract surgery subsequently, you need to take care of all these features. Here, just a small example of showing how a patient who's got uh, diabetic macular edema, just with a good systemic control, one year later his retina looks so much better. Now is the time when you can take up the patient for a cataract surgery. Now preoperatively, it's already been sp uh, spoken that a control of the HbA1c is so important and even a 1% control of HbA1c tends to reduce the incidence of cataract in these patients by almost 20%. However, we do not want to get a drastic and sudden uh, you know, reduction in your HbA1c as this can worsen both your macular edema as well as cause a progression to your diabetic retinopathy. So you need to be in close contact with the endocrinologist and you, know, you are always in a hurry as a cataract surgery, you want to operate as soon as possible. But make sure that the HbA1c is gradually reduced. Ideally, it should not be more than 0.5% per month. And in case a patient of yours who's had a sudden change in HPA1C, you may want to follow up them with more frequent fundus examinations. So preoperatively, we need to make sure that uh, inflammation is under control, the ocular surface looks healthy, the patient's glaucoma, associated glaucoma is under control, and these patients we know are more challenging because they have pu uh, poor pupil dilation the endothelial dysfunction is uh, associated, and even those who have got multiple injections, they tend to have more of zonular instability. So diabetics, as has already been said, they have higher inflammatory mediators. So preoperatively, we must start them on NSAIDs, and I prefer to start them one week prior to the surgery and continue it for at least four to eight weeks after surgery. The ocular surface needs to be looked into carefully, so do not miss the fact that the patient may have an associated blepharitis, mebomitis that can put them at greater risk of endophthalmitis. And so take care of this, and any unstable tear film can lead to very varying keratometric readings, and especially if you're planning out a patient who may need a toric IOL, you do want to look at this prior to it, prior to surgery. Another thing we need to look at is that NVI, most of the times our optometrist dilates the patient and we don't see the patient in an undilated state and we can miss NVI. Presence of NVI is a good indicator, even if you have a mature cataract and you see NVI, you know that this patient is likely to have PDR, you can counsel the patient and you can also talk to your uh, retina colleague uh, for the future uh, planning. Now, glaucoma is often associated in our diabetic patients. Uh, this needs to be taken care of. If the patient is on a single medicine, you can go ahead for cataract surgery alone. However, if your patient is on three or more medications, then you know that he is likely to require combined surgery. 
You also need to see how good is the control, is the patient compliant with the medications, is he likely to follow up post-surgery. In such cases, uh, if you have a good compliant patient, you may do a cataract and subsequently a glaucoma surgery as when required. However, if the patient already has uh, advanced glaucoma and is unlikely to come to you, then you must plan a combined surgery. It's better to, it's preferable to uh, discontinue your PG analogs at least two weeks prior to surgery as it's shown to enhance the macular edema. A detailed uh, posterior segment evaluation is a must and if you can do it yourself, great. Otherwise, always be associated with a retina uh, person like I am. <laughs> so documentation is must. You must do your fundus photography and Dr. Manpreet has already elaborated on this. And uh, ideally, your post uh, posterior segment uh, management should precede the anterior segment, provided the visibility is good. So depending on the clarity of the lens, you will plan out how to manage the diabetic retinopathy. And the intervention depends upon the stage of diabetic retinopathy. If you have no diabetic retinopathy or just mild to moderate, you can go ahead with an early cataract surgery. However, if you have maculopathy, or if you have PDR that needs to be taken care of, it has priority over your cataract. Again, it's been shown by many studies that the central macular thickness, even after an, uh, uh, you know, a normal FACO, uncomplicated FACO, there is a, st a statistical increase in your CMT. This has again been shown due to the blood aqueous barrier which leaks. And I'll just take another minute. So intraoperatively, we know that we have challenges of pu uh, poor pupil dilation, and this uh, uh, needs to be taken care of. Your OT must be, uh, you know, you should have the right inventory, the proper viscoelastics should be available, pupillary expanders, CTRs, capsular hooks, and the right IOL. The selection of the IOL is very critical. Biometry is especially challenging in such patients. They may have undergone a vitrectomy, may have silicon oil, so that needs to be taken care of. Preferably a hydrophobic acrylic, acrylic lens is now uh, advisable. Multifocal lenses are generally a big no unless you have no diabetic retinopathy and the patient is extremely motivated. So we've uh, seen that diabetic retinopathy makes your surgery much more challenging. The complication rates are much higher. So it should be taken, uh, done by an experienced surgeon. A few intraoperative pearls, you may prefer to do it under a block rather than topical. The rexes should be of an optimum size so that you can follow up the fundus examination. A good viscoelastic is a must. You may avoid hydrodissection, especially in post vitrectomy cases where you see a posterior subcapsular cataract as it may have a PC defect. Zonules are li often lax after multiple injections, so be prepared with your CTRs. A meticulous capsular uh, cortical cleanup and polishing because you don't want to do an early YAG in such cases. And an IOL should always be put in the bag. Remove all the viscoelastic again to avoid the post-op uh, IOP spikes. And if you're doing a combined surgery or the patient requires a laser post-op, it's always better to suture your cases. Do not let your ego gen get in the middle. So post-op uh, management in such cases, um, you need to give an aggressive uh, topical steroids and NSAIDs, lubricants, manage the glaucoma, and avoid early YAG. A close follow-up with your retina consultant, your patient should be primed for it that he has to follow up. So uh, just to highlight here that uh, if you're missing out on the fundus examination, you can land into a medical legal soup. So it's very important to take a fundus photograph and to uh, do all your uh, investigations like OCT and angiography prior to taking up your patient for surgery. So my take home message is that the overall visual outcome can be good if you plan your surgeries well, if you take care of the uh, post-op uh, uh, treatment, do a frequent fundus examination and prime your patients that they need to come uh, closely follow up and need to be seen at an uh, you know frequent time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Ritu. Uh, I think we uh, don't have time for any questions. 
which basically indicates that we need more time for such instruction courses. I thank all my inst uh, co-instructors uh, for such wonderful presentations which were done on time and to Dr. Mrs. Verma for the keynote address. Thank you all and thanks all for coming in such large numbers.